we can get started. So uh, good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Coast Watcher training session. My name is Alyssa Barassa. I am the program coordinator of Coast Watchers. And on the call with me tonight is Erin Laurie, the executive director of the Coastal Center. So tonight we'll be welcoming all Coast Watchers as we learn about uh, program changes and updates in relation to the Coast Watcher app. So it's important to highlight the funders that have made this program possible. We have RBC Tech for Nature, Rotary Club of Goderich, and Bruce Power. So for those who are not familiar with the Lake Huron Coastal Center, uh, we are a non-government, non-profit charitable organization that was founded in 1998 with the goals of protecting and restoring Lake Huron's coastal environment. And we have a small but mighty staff of four people. So at its core, Coast Watchers is a data collection program where volunteers submit reports to us to be analyzed and shared with community groups, researchers, the general public through our yearly Coast Watcher report. So Coast Watchers is our longest running program. Uh, the program launched in 2005, making this our 18th monitoring season. So this long term data set allows us to track changes and trends seen on Lake Huron um, over time. And it's also an opportunity for people uh, to learn new skills and be connected to the environment in a positive and helpful way. So this program uses the community science approach, which means we have local volunteers who collect specific data. So you might be wondering, how do we use this data? So each year the data is shared, shared with provincial and national databases where possible. So for example, the Invasive Species Center, species at risk and plastic pollution databases. Um, the databases is also used internally to better understand where beach cleanups might be needed, where there could be some erosion control or outreach and education programs. So this training session is going to be broken down into two parts. So for the first part, we'll be uh, talking about general program changes as a result of our new Coast Watchers app. And then the second part, uh, we'll take a little bit of a closer look at each report and uh, kind of outline how the data is taken. So let's get started. Um, so I just want to make sure everyone has completed the required steps to officially become a Coast Watcher. So number one, um, complete the online form at www.lakehuron.ca slash Coast Watchers. I assume most of you have I've done this, that's how I was able to get your contact. But if you haven't, that's number one. Number two, choose a primary monitoring location and share the GPS coordinates uh, with me via coastwatchers at lakehuron.ca. So um, I'll, I'll show you how to take the, the, how to find the GPS coordinates in a little bit. So number three, uh, you can create an account on the Coast Watcher app, which I will show you how to do that in a little bit. And then number four, start monitoring. Um, number five, it's good to remember, uh, you can refer back to the general protocol report and the FAQ page located on the Coast Watcher training page. Everything that I'm gonna talk about today is in that report. So health and safety. It's always important to remember health and safety when you're out on the shoreline. Um, it's a really good idea to use a buddy system you can bring someone with you to do your monitoring or tell someone uh, where you are when you're on the shoreline. Uh, do not monitor during a thunderstorm um, and do not go into the lake to record water temperature if you feel unsafe. Uh, for example, if the water is too cold or if it's wavy. Remember, you come first. So some of you might be wondering, um, why do we need an app in the first place? What problems will it solve? So in 2021, Coast Watchers, uh, the Coast Watcher program reached capacity. So that means there was a maximum amount of data coming in that we could handle manually anyways. So the goal of the app is to lessen the resources needed to manually input the data, as well as increase the amount of data and volunteers that are able to participate in the program. <clears throat> so let's break that down a little bit. Um, the app will decrease the amount of staff time needed to organize and input data. It will increase volunteer and data capacity. 
It will streamline data collection, which will eliminate human error. Um, we can change and adapt the reports to meet the needs of environmental organizations and researchers who might find this data useful. If we see a recurring theme uh, that people are interested in, such as climate change or plastic pollution, we can adapt the reports as needed. Uh, the data will also be more easily shared with partnering groups in real time, which is very important. Um, and it will connect people to other coastal center opportunities, such as donating and our other programs. So this is a web-based app, meaning it's not available in the App Store, but it can be accessed on the internet by any brand. So that's Apple, Android, etc. Um, it can be used on any device that connects to the internet, including a cell phone, desktop, laptop, tablet, um, but it is formatted both best for mobile phones. Uh, you might be wondering, why do we choose a web-based app? Well, it turns out Developing an app is very expensive, and uh, for now, a web-based app is the best solution to have our desired look and functionality while keeping within um, our budget. So it works the exact same as an app you could find on an app store, but at a much lower cost. Uh, the Lake Huron Coastal Center does have ownership over this app, and it can be easily ad adapted to um, the iOS or Android app stores in a future adaptation. <clears throat> so this link is not yet public um, since Coast Watchers need proper training to use it. So please save the link somewhere that can be easily accessed every time you go out and do your monitoring. And Erin has the link with her and she can share it in the chat. <clears throat> okay, so Create an account. Um, if you are a new Coast Watcher, you just simply sign up by creating a, an account. If you are an existing Coast Watcher, your email has already been imported into our new system. So uh, the, the, temp, the use of the temporary password CW in all caps can be used to get into the app. So once you are in, you can navigate to your account tab to change the password. So I know some of our returning Coast Watchers had difficulty uh, creating an account and I apologize for that. Um, it took the development team a bit longer than I had anticipated to set up the temporary password, but it should be working now. I can also stay at the end of this call and help anyone who's specifically having problems accessing the app. So uh, this app has allowed for some exciting advancements to the program, and I'll break down each one. <clears throat> so field sheets that have previously been completed on paper have been adapted to online reports that are submitted through the app. So if you do have access to a mobile phone, tablet, or computer, you can record and submit all data and photos through the Coast Watcher app. If you do not have access to a mobile phone, tablet, or computer, you can mail your completed physical sheets at the end of each month to the LHCC mailbox. Um, so that's PO Box 477, Goddard, Ontario, N7A4C7. And then I will manually input it into our new system. And if you are having just trouble in general with technology, I totally understand. We can also have one on one calls to to work with each other. So the Coast Watcher IDs, they are used when communicating with the program coordinator. So me through email or over the phone, if you'd like to remain anonymous. Um, it's also used when discussing specific data in public reports. So um, an account is so once an account is created, each Coast Watcher is assigned a new Coast Watcher ID. Existing Coast Watchers that already uh, had a Coast Watcher number, number will be replaced with a new number in this new system. So uh, new numbers can be viewed on your account tab, and I'll show you where that is just in a little bit. <clears throat> so submission of zeros. In the past, we've encouraged submission of zeros. But starting this season, uh, we are asking Coast Watchers only report on what they see with just a few exceptions. So uh, when you start a report, all questions that have a star beside it must be filled out. But I'll give you some examples of how to work with zeros. 
Um, if there is no wildlife at all on the beach when you're monitoring, the wildlife report would be skipped on that day. But if you start, say, the human activities page because there was three people on the beach, but there were no dogs, you would submit three, three under people on the beach and zero under dogs on the beach. Because since you started the human activities report, you have to you know, answer the questions. So um, atmospheric conditions is, a, is something that it can always be reported. So consent forms, uh, that's liability and information release forms, are now included in the process of creating a Coast Watchers account. So that's great, super easy when you sign up. Uh, we already have that information. <clears throat> so no cellular service, that happens a lot on the water. Um, it turns, it's kind of unfortunate, but you must have a service to submit a report in the field. In case service is lost, please bring up a, a backup field sheet to record your report questions. Um, the field sheets will be on the Coast Watcher training page just to print out for this reason. So the data can be submitted on the app when you get back home. Make sure to drag the pin on your map from your current location back to your monitoring location, and you can also change the time of your submission uh, to when the report was actually taken. We are working on a save as draft feature, but uh, that'll be an, uh, another adaptation. So when to monitor? Uh, the monitoring season is uh, 26 weeks long from May 1st until October 31st. Ghost watchers commit to monitoring the same place once per week, ideally at the same time of week. So consistency is really important to keep the data unbiased across the monitoring season. If you miss a few weeks, no problem at all. Um, but if you know you're going to be missing, you know, three or more weeks, maybe consider sh sharing your uh, login information with a trusted friend or family member and uh, they can monitor for you. So your commitment <clears throat> to this program is during the monitoring season. But with the increased data capacity, we now have the option to accept submissions outside of the usual monitoring season. <clears throat> so if you see something interesting and you want to tell us outside of May till October, now you can. So um, if you're a seasonal visitor, I also wanted to mention, um, and you can maybe only report a few weeks out of the year, that's okay too. Just talk to us about your availability and we'll make something work. My throat's getting a little dry. <clears throat> okay, so where should you monitor? So you'll pick a, a section of the shoreline that is relevant for you. So for example, if uh, you're a cottager and you want to you know, monitor in front of your cottage, um, you can definitely do that. If you just love a, a certain public beach and you go like once a week, you can monitor there as well. So you just have to make sure you choose a specific spot, specifically uh, when you're taking data on wind and waves. Um, so other observational data can be recorded 15 meters on either side of that primary location. So you're, you're basically uh, monitoring 30 meters total of the beach. So uh, if you're gonna go on another, you know, a private property, please get permission if that's from your neighbors or, or whoever. So I'm going to give a step by step on how to find coordinates of your monitoring location. So uh, this is just an example. This is Grand Bend Beach. Um, to find the coordinates, you would first open Google Maps. Second, zoom into your monitoring location, wherever that is on the shoreline. Three, place your cursor on your specific monitoring location and then click. Once you click, the GPS coordinates will pop up at the bottom of the screen like you see here. Um, and that there is just an example. So uh, there's a few, reason why, few reasons why we collect GPS coordinates. <clears throat> it allows us to track which areas of Lake Huron are being monitored. It tells us uh, you know, where maybe more program outreach is needed. And based on your reports, we'll know exactly where assistance may be needed. Uh, for example, if there was, say, a large pollution event. OK, on to part two. So now we'll be talking more specifically about each report. And there is some changes here for um, returning Coast Watchers. 
So this is the home page. Um, I've provided screenshots of all of our app pages. Um, so on the home page, you will find a swipe through screen that provides users with the opportunity to learn more um, about the Coastal Center on our website, donate, visit the frequently asked questions page, etc. So clicking on the report screen takes you to your submission topic page. There you can choose which reports you would like to submit that day based on what is observed. So at the end of every report, you will find a map so we'll know exactly what stretch of the shoreline you'll be taking your data from. So at the top of every report page, there's a photo submission option. So this is our atmospheric conditions page, and I'll provide information on the next few pages about how to take each recording. So this has a lot of uh, quantitative re recordings for atmospheric conditions, so we'll need some equipment for, for this report. So this is uh, for visibility. So visibility is defined as a measure of the distance at which an object can be clearly recognized. So for our purposes, we're looking at the horizon. So um, it can be used to assess trends in atmospheric conditions, say. So I have some examples here. So the top, you can clearly see the horizon. You would mark yes. For the bottom, you know, there's a lot of rain in the air that day, maybe some smog, depending on where you are. The, the horizon is not visible and you would click no. So wave height is measured using the Beaufort scale. So this is a standardized way of measuring wave height. So this scale describes wave height using descriptive words uh, with the corresponding wind speeds. So um, if I were to say that the waves are like a level one in Goddard because there might only be a light air, small ripples, um, someone in Meaford would know exactly what I'm talking about since it's standardized. Uh, a zero would be glass smooth and mirror-like. And uh, we rarely see waves that exceed about an eight or a level nine on Lake Huron. Some examples of the different wave heights. Just maybe look back at these and when you're looking out on the water, say, oh yeah, I guess that looks like a number four or maybe it's pretty wavy, a number six. <clears throat> so wind and wave direction is measured using the compass rows. So the compass rows could be, will, uh, should be printed off and brought with you to your monitoring location. Um, so you actually just lay the compass rows flat and you um, point the north arrow to the north. So when, you, uh, when you're down there, you can feel the wind and the waves, and that's how you determine where the wind and waves are originating from. So for example, if you estimate that it's an east wind, meaning that the wind is blowing from the east towards the west, you should record a 90. So we would like you to record a 90 instead of east because it's a bit more accurate for us. So some days wind direction can be a bit difficult to determine. So to help you uh, with that, you can look for a flag blowing in the wind, or you could even bring a stick down with you with a string attached. On days where there is no wind, you can simply type zero, zero, and I'll know what you mean. So a kestrel. Um, a kestrel measures water temperature as well as current max and average wind speeds. So the fan at the top here, this little propeller, that's what measures the wind speed. And this little guy right here, um, that's what measures the temperature. So to take wind speed measurements, face into the wind, hold the kestrel in front of your body and wait about one minute for the instrument to capture an accurate measurement. Um, then you can record all three measurements. So the instrument, uh, it displays different icons uh, for each measurement. <clears throat> so you can use the buttons to change the display, and if the instrument um, is not showing kilometers per hour, you can press and hold the middle button while pressing the left or right button uh, to find your proper unit. So the pool thermometer, uh, this is used to uh, measure both air and water temperature. How do you use it? Number one, um, this is all if you're comfortable with this, by the way. <laughs> Number one, you wade into the water. Um, at a depth of approximately one meter. 
Number two, you hold the thermometer by the string so that it dangles halfway between the top of the water and the bottom of the lake. And then you hold it for three seconds. Um, you can bring the thermometer just below the surface to take a quick measurement of, without removing it from the water. And the readings are always in Celsius. So how to access the equipment? Uh, new volunteers are asked to print the compass rose from the Coast Watcher training page of the LHCC website. So um, considering the increase of volunteer numbers, uh, the LHCC will not be able to equip every Coast Watcher with a Kestrel. Each Kestrel costs about $150, uh, which is a lot of money for a small charity like ours. So volunteers that are interested in using a Kestrel must have to pay a $25 equipment deposit fee through the LHCC website store. Uh, once the equipment is returned in good, good condition, uh, the deposit will be fully refunded back to the volunteer and the inventory will be updated on our website store for the next person to purchase. <clears throat> We do have a few extra pool thermometers this year, so if you're interested in taking water and air temperature um, and you don't have one at home, you can send me the email and I'll get that over to you. This is also a reminder that using a Kestrel and a pool thermometer are not a requirement of the program. If you don't feel comfortable going in the water, that's totally okay. You do not have to, um, and you shouldn't if you feel unsafe. Um, as well, everyone won't be able to have access to a Kestrel, so that is also not a required um, question. Plastic Watch, so we added a new addition to the Plastic Watch report. Now we can report on microplastics, which is super exciting. This report also helps us determine um, what the most common litter types are and where maybe a future beach cleanup event is needed in the future. So these are some examples of different kinds of plastic pollution that we see on the shoreline. The top is microplastic. So there's a few different kinds um, that is all included in the protocol. Um, we also have shoreline litter. That's stuff that can be easily picked up. Um, a lot of Coast Watchers do, and we really appreciate that. You know, we have pounds of litters uh, removed every year because of you. So if you feel so inclined, please pick it up. <laughs> Um, we also have large debris, such as tires and things like that. <clears throat> so this is the wildlife report page where you can report on what wildlife is present on the shoreline that day, including species at risk. So once the animals are chosen, you can fill in the corresponding numbers of how many are there. Um, species at risk are animals and plants uh, whose populations are endangered or threatened. So some species at risk on Lake Huron include the piping plover, snapping turtles, pitcher's thistle, and the monarch butterfly. So our most identified species at risk is the monarch butterfly and the piping plover, as we've seen from past years. Um, if you're unsure if a plant or animal is a species at risk, you can take a photo of it and send it to us and we can help you identify it. Um, there's also a lot of researchers on, or a lot of resources, sorry, on the LHCC website to improve your species identification skills. It really is just a wealth of knowledge there that I really um, encourage you to, to go take a look there. So this is the algae report page. So it turns out algae is a very difficult thing to identify without a ton of experience. So we have included specific questions and a photo submission requirement to narrow down which type of algae it is. Uh, we're also working on a algae field guide so you can compare photos and descriptions to what you see on the shore uh, to estimate the length and the width of the algae, both on the beach and in the water. It's helpful to use pacing as a tool. So it's estimated that around two steps, two strides, is 1.5 meters in length. And of course, um, there is a label to not touch the algae since some um, can be very toxic. So this is our human activity page. Uh, this is where people can report on how the shoreline is being used. Each category impacts the shoreline in different ways. For example, motorized vehicles on beaches is really detrimental to um, you know, beaches and dune health. 
and off-leash dogs are one of uh, the main causes of bird mortality on the shoreline, especially for um, some birds who kind of run around and they don't fly as fast, such as the piping plover. So this is the storm damage report. So on this page, we track sightings of beach erosion, natural debris, and human-made debris. Um, we have a drop-down list of common debris that volunteers have reported on in the past, just to make it easy to click away for volunteers to, um, to choose what they see. So these photos were submitted by a coast watcher in 2021. So this is the difference of 13 months near Wasega Beach. So I included this picture because it's a perfect example of a time lapse photo. So when submitting photos of erosion in the storm damage section, time lapse photos are especially valuable since they give clear evidence of shoreline changes over time. So it's really important to take the photo at the exact same location if you can. And it's really great if you can get a stationary object in the picture, such as the staircase. And sharing this photo <clears throat> on our social media just really gives people a clear look at what's happening on our shoreline. <coughs> So when you submit a report, a nice message comes up. Um, this on, on the My Submissions tab, you can see the status of past reports. And on the bottom right there, I don't know if you can see my cursor. So that is where you can access your account information. So um, on that tab, you can change your password from the temporary password, and you can also view um, your new Coast Watcher ID. <clears throat> so next steps, uh, the first iteration of the app is completed. Woohoo, I hope everyone's as happy as I am. Uh, where do we go from here? Well, the first thing is feedback from you. Um, this is a work in progress and this is my first time, you know, doing something like this. So it's really a learning experience for everyone. So I'd love to, you know, check in and um, just see how everyone's finding it, if they think some updates need to be needed and need to be made and um, yeah so that's number one number two we have an opportunity for winter monitoring so we're going to start thinking about how we can utilize that maybe we can do ice cover winter wildlife open to suggestions um, bug fixes of course along the way and i also wanted to to ask all of you to see if you would be interested in maybe a, a monthly coast watcher check-in so um, this would maybe be at the last Thursday of every month um, in the evening, maybe a time like this. We could just uh, check in, discuss what we saw on the shoreline. Um, I'll be open for questions and I'd like to hear your thoughts in the discussion uh, section. So it's important to highlight again, the funders that uh, make this program possible. We have RBC Tech for Nature, Rotary Club of Goderich and Bruce Power. Okay, thank you everyone. Erin um, can field your questions and